right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined all the way from Toronto in Canada by Sanjay Nath. How are you doing, Sanjay? I'm doing well. How are you doing, John? Great. And Sanjay? internationally renowned speaker sharing insights on leadership performance uh, in 2018 was inducted into the Canadian Speakers Hall of Fame uh, and you started international speaking uh, business at the age of 19 which is quite incredible plus you've written a few uh, several books including the 108010 10 principle and which is what you're known best known for a framework that helps individuals and teams improve performance a methodology that in, combines best practices with small wins to help empower audiences to reach their stretch goals. And what we're going to talk about today is performance and leadership. So maybe even to get to get started, Sanjay, maybe um, explain your your ten eighty ten business principle because that sounds fascinating. Sure, uh, ten eighty ten principle basically says this: you can take any group of people and you can subdivide them to three groups. Top ten percent bottom 10% and majority 80%. The top 10 want to be there, the bottom 10 have to be there, and the majority 80 tends to follow whichever group is more empowered. Right, so that's what it is at a high level. Let me give you a quick example of where you've seen it. So if you've ever been to a, a, a live theatrical event, right, a, a concert, a musical, something like that, and you found yourself giving a standing ovation to a production that you really didn't feel was a standing ovation. Uh, that's the 10-80-10 principle at work. So what happens was, you know, you're watching this live theater show and you are what, I'm so going to assume you're what's called the majority 80. You're a go with the flow kind of guy. But if you happen to be sitting next to the lead role's mother, as soon as that show is done, she is on her feet, hooting and hollering, clapping and throwing roses and giving a standing ovation. And out of social convention and trying to be polite, you're like feeling kind of awkward. So you end up standing up and giving a standing ovation as well. So mm -hmm. there's an example of how the top 10 got empowered and the majority 80 followed. On the flip side, I'm sure everyone uh, who's listening to this podcast has, has been in a situation where you've been in a presentation that was bad, right? The content was useless. The delivery was hideous. It was just a complete waste of your time. And you kind of look around the room and everyone is either involved in a side conversation or they've opened their phones, they're checking their emails, or they're playing Candy Crush. And so what do you do? You kind of very subtly reach in your pocket, you pull out your phone, mm -hmm. and you're doing it. So there's an example of the bottom 10 got empowered and the majority 80 tend to follow them as well. And, and that's a very high level, uh, but it basically says, you know, it, it's about momentum and it's about kind of where the energy, you know, where the energy is, people tend to gravitate towards. Yeah, no, that's a that's a fascinating example. I think it's isn't that uh, the Tony Robbins one where where focus goes, energy flows, and uh, uh, exactly what you're talking about. And I think that's a really fascinating point because I don't think people realize how much of a drag that that bottom ten percent can be sometimes, and Absolutely. how much of an influence it can be. Oh, I, without question. And you know, you're you're you know uh, mentioning Tony Robbins, but I, literally, I give you hundreds of examples of. That predate Tony Robbins, like uh, what is yeah. Fredo, the 80-20 rule? 80% 80 of your results come from 20% of your efforts. So where are you going to put your time, energy, and uh, you know your resources? You're going to put it where you're getting the results. You go back a couple hundred years before that, and you get uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton had three laws of motion, and the first one said something to the effect of a body in motion tends to stay in motion, a body at rest tends to stay at rest. What was mm -hmm. he saying in a non scientific way? He was saying action follows action and inaction follows inaction. That means that if you're trying to sell something, you're more likely to sell it to someone who's already either a previous buyer or ready to buy than someone who's never even thought about it. It's a completely different conversation that you need to have with someone who's not interested or against it or never thought about it versus someone who is top 10, who's already a, an eager participant in whatever it is you're trying to get them to buy into. So what? So how can you how can you then ensure that the eighty percent is gravitating or taking their lead or from the high performing ten percent as opposed to getting dragged down by the lower ten percent? So it really becomes a, a question of balance. Where is where is the balance of power? 
And so I, I, again, I, I'm giving you a very high level example. My yeah. entire career is built on this, right? So uh, for me to do it in a couple of minutes, we're leaving out a lot of the nuances. However, the, the formula basically works like this. If you have this 10-80-10 split, if you choose to focus your resources on the top 10, over time, the majority 80 will follow them. Then the bottom 10 does something that I think is quite remarkable. The bottom 10 will actually break up into two groups. One group will kind of go, wait for me, I want to do that too. And they'll run after the group. And the other group will kind of go, well, I didn't sign up for this. And they're going to leave uh -huh. and you're going to kind of get natural attrition. So how do you do that is you, it's kind of a kind of a double, a double effort. You're going to, the language I use is neutralize the bottom 10 and you're going to empower the top 10. Neutralize the bottom 10, power the top 10. When you neutralize something, you spend the minimal amount of time, energy, attention, and thought so it no longer draws resources. When you are empowering something, you spend the maximum amount of time, energy, attention, and thought so it no longer draws resources. And again, if I can bring that to life with a bit of an example, uh, as mentioned in my intro, you said I, I'm a professional speaker and I know this may sound hard to believe, but sometimes I'm in front of audiences and check this out. Not everyone in the audience wants to be there. <laughs> I know I'm the only person in the entire universe that's ever happened to. Uh, but no, but every audience has a top 10 and a bottom 10. People sure. that want to be there and people that have to be there. If I choose to spend my resources on the bottom 10, that is the guy or girl who doesn't want to be there, that's involved in their phone, that has their laptop open, they're doing work. First of all, I don't even know why they're a bottom 10. They may be a bottom 10, not because they're a bad person, but because they have life circumstances in that particular moment that makes them bottom 10. Mm -hmm. You may be giving them great information, but maybe their daughter is pregnant and they're waiting for the text so they can go to the hospital, right? right. They also could just be a jerk. My, my point is there's a whole spectrum of it. And for you to try to win them over and convince them is futile effort. So if there's a guy in the back corner hacking away at his iPhone and I'm trying to win him over, as a speaker, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at them. I'm going to send energy. I'm going to invite them into the conversation. I'm going to waste a whole lot of time. And, and this strategy leads to what I call the triple whammy, three whammies. Whammy number one, 99% of the time, that individual does not change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Whammy number two, I've just spent an hour, a day, a semester, a career, or whatever it was, trying to win them over, convince them. And it's extreme, extremely demotivating and draining to me. So that's whammy number two. I get demotivated. Whammy number three, here's the most powerful one that most people forget about, which is how does everyone else around that person feel? And the answer is ignore. Mm -hmm. If yep. you want to train an audience to not listen to you, pay attention to the people that don't want to be there. Then what happens is everyone else keeps looking at it. If a speaker keeps looking at the guy in the back corner who's looking at his laptop the whole time and <laughs> Aaron, the audience will start looking there. I mean, a speaker who keeps looking at their watch on stage can get the audience to look at their watch. On the flip side, you want to engage, which is what your question was, is I want to focus my energy attention on the top 10. Who are they? Well, they flag themselves. We know who our top 10 are. In a speaking mm -hmm. instance, they're smiling, they're nodding, they're leaning forward, they're taking notes. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, if I want to tell a joke, I don't tell it to the bottom 10. They don't even know I'm telling the joke. I tell it to the top 10. And if they truly are top 10, not only do they laugh, they take, they take laughter on steroids. They guffaw, they chortle, they lose their mind, and they slap their knee. They're laughing mm -hmm. out loud, ha, 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 ha. The majority 80 starts looking at them going, what, why are you laughing? Or the right. even better than that, they actually start laughing themselves. They're like, <laughs> I'm laughing because you're laughing. <laughs> I don't even get the joke. But they start <laughs> laughing. And once you get this critical mass, which is your top 10 plus your majority 80, once you have that critical mass, the bottom 10 breaks up and does one of two things. Either they go, what do you say? Was it funny? Mm -hmm. Or they say, shut up. I'm trying to send an email. And they leave. Yeah. A natural yeah. attrition. Yeah, you know those. Uh, that's that's fascinating. Great, great example. Um, and, the, and the funny thing is, Sanjay, is that I'm we tend to approach things very differently. I mean, it's like, if you look in most organizations, what are people, we fixate on the things that people, on the people who aren't performing, on the people who aren't doing the things that we want them to do. Uh, and sometimes we try to 
fix them, even though they're never going to be able to do it, instead of like looking maybe, well, maybe they're good at something else. And we don't invest enough time with the people who are the top 10 because we go, well, they're okay. We don't need to invest in them. I need to focus down on these people. And it's like, a, it's like that whole awful performance review process where people bring you in and they, in companies and they say, hey, Sanjay, well done. You've done these two things really well this year. Now here's 52 things that you've done crap and you need to work on. I, you, I, you're absolutely right. It's that it's a mentality, and I'm not sure why we default to it. It seems uh-huh. to make emotional sense, but it actually does not make logical sense. And again, if, if I can give you an example, um, yeah. I was speaking for an event. Uh, this is a while ago, maybe 15 years ago, and it was for a bunch of principals of schools. And so I did my whole little bit, and six months later, I was at another event, and one of the principals who was in the first event was there too. And she said to me, she said, hey, you, you're, you're that 10 80, 10 guy. I said, I am. She said, that stuff actually works. I said, that's great, considering, you know, it's my career. Um, <laughs> so I said to her, I said, you know, tell me your story. She said, well, I got to tell you, I have a staff of about 100 teachers on my, in my school. And you got to keep in mind the time frame. 15 years ago, smart boards were just becoming a thing. These days, if you walk to a school, smart boards are everywhere, but there was a, you know, it was a crossover between whiteboards, chalkboards, and smart boards. Yeah. And so she was saying they were considering implementing smart boards in the school. And she said, you know, I have 100 teachers, and I got to tell you, they were almost a bang on 1080-10 split. She said, I had about 10 teachers. She said, you call them top 10, and I call them keeners. And so I suggested we get smart boards, and she said, they went home. And they planned out the next 17, year of less, 17 years of lesson plans. And I said, okay, they're keeners. Yeah. And she said, then I had 10 teachers who you call them bottom 10. She said, I call them 1478ers. And I was like, why, why do you call them 1478ers? And she said, oh, because anytime I try to implement any change or disrupt the routine in the slightest way, they cross their arms, they pout and go, I got 1478 days till I retire. Don't put this junk on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> and she said then i had about 80 you call the majority 80 she said i call them go with the flow and they were like you know get the smart boards cool we use them don't get them we won't use them whatever and she said so normally this is what i would do normally i would buy 100 smart boards i would give 10 to the top 10 and ignore them because they're self-starters yeah i yep. give 80 to the majority 80 and I would answer their questions. Then I would give 10 to the bottom 10 and I would go to war with them. And yeah. every day I would explain to them that they had to do it. It was mandated. I would fight with their unions. I would chat with the lawyers and it was just a big freaking mess. And she said, I heard you speak this whole 1080 10. I thought I would try a different approach. So all I did was I bought 10 smart boards. And she said, I gave 10 of them to the top 10 and I let them go. And she said, right off the bat, the first thing I noticed was the energy around the whole smart board movement was completely different mm-hmm. because people were now sharing wins. There was a synergy in the room. There was a, it was just a much more positive, vibrant energy. And she said, I let them go. And exactly what you said would happen, happened. So here's the quick setup. Okay. So there were two teachers. We're going to call them Miss Majority 80 and Miss Top 10. So Miss Majority 80 is a majority 80. Miss Top 10 is a top 10. So the kids are sitting in Miss Top 10's classroom and she is like explaining to them how this new smart board technology works and how she can zap the homework to them and it's going to save them time and be environmentally friendly. And keep in mind, this is pretty cool for the kids. They haven't seen it either. Yeah. And so the bell rings and they're going from, the kids are going from this class, Miss Top 10's class, over across the hall, the Miss Majority 80's class. And as they're walking, they're kind of mumbling about what they saw. You know, oh, that was really cool. And I didn't know you could do that. And that's going to save the environment. And, that, and as they walk into Miss Majority 80's classroom, she kind of overhears them talking and the buzz and excitement. She says, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, oh, well, Miss Top 10, she can do this. And then she can do that with the smart board. It's really kind of cool. And she says to the kids, she goes, hold on a second. And she walks across the hall to Miss Top 10's classroom. And she walks into the room and she says, the kids are telling me that you can, oh, what? I, I didn't know you could do that. That's really cool. Uh, so the principal said within a week, Miss Majority 80 was in her office going, well, where's my smart board? And she said, I made it a rule that I would only ask 
or pardon me, I'd only order smart boards for people who specifically came and asked me for them. She said, it's been six months. There are currently 63 smart boards in the school. And mm. she said, just yes, last week in the most sheepish way possible, one of my 1478ers came up to me, not making eye contact, looking at the ground saying, uh, <laughs> when, 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 am, when am I getting mine? And I just ordered it. Yeah. But you know, what's, what's beautiful about that example, um, Sanjay, is again, like you said, is like human nature being what it is, is we would say, oh, order the hundred uh, boards and we're going to spend all our time like beating the 10% over the head who aren't using it. But what's beautiful about that is you is the, is using the idea of success and comp role modeling and competition. And because there's nothing that gets people more, if you're on the outside looking in at people who now look like something cool is happening and it's working for them, you immediately want in. If you're in the bottom 10, you're, hopefully you're starting to feel a little bit foolish about yourself and maybe you know you're going to start to talk to the other people and and get a different perspective but what as i said what i like about it is it it models success as opposed to just having a, a, a smorgasbord of results I, I know this is not a an official uh research project by any sure. stretch but i've been a professional speaker for just over 28 years I've spoken over 2,000 live audiences, and right now people still think I'm 12. So 28 <laughs> years ago, um, the only group I had credibility speaking with was students. So I've spoken to a lot of high schools, uh, probably in the neighborhood of about 1,200. Now, the reason I, I wanted to preface that is to say this isn't just a one or two shot deal, but I found mm -hmm. a very, very distinct relationship between trophy cases and the behavior of students. So in hundreds of high schools that I've been to, when I walk into the school and you have a trophy case prominent and displayed, and it doesn't have to be fancy, but it needs to be mm -hmm. well kept and up to date. So if you still have the 1964 volleyball team and that's the last time <laughs> it was made, it doesn't count. If the shell's falling over, it doesn't count. But when it's prominent, I find that the behavior of the students is considerably better than when it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's a very unofficial survey, but. I think to your point, that's what it is. Is there something in the back of the head, people going, I want to get up there, or there's a pride yeah. or something to strive for. And as much as we can highlight the behaviors we're looking for and putting our attention and energy there, more people will be attracted to that as opposed to fighting with the people that are the bottom 10. Because the more you do that, you guess what you're doing? You're putting attention there. And other people mm -hmm. will be like, all right, that's, that's how we get the attention. I'm in. So we yeah. really really aware of where we put that energy because that is exactly what we're going to repeat. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interest. I, I think that's a very interesting ob observation because yeah, you have the people who go, okay, well, this is cool. This is a, a great place. Obviously you know, I want to be part of this. I want my name up there. And then, you know, you get the other people who go, well, I better up my game because clearly, you know, they're very, you know, results and they're performance oriented here. So it's a great, it's a great knock on, knock on effect. Um, so, uh, so how much when you, when you, uh, initiate a project like this, so you say like the, the bottom 10 splits itself into two and a lot of them kind of self-select out. And I think that is, that is one of the most important things. Cause let's face it. I mean, constantly being on people and then having to put them on performance plans and then, have, you know, or maybe ultimately having to, uh, move them on. It's not enjoyable for anybody. I mean, it's not good for the person because they're not where they should be it's not good for you because let's face it you're just you're you wasting your end time and energy on this so this idea of people actually self-selecting out i think that's an incredibly important piece uh, for any organization oh 100 percent. and and the, the nice thing is this is by focusing on your top 10 and if i ask people this if i say hey during your working hours if you were spending most of your time with your top 10 performers your top 10 vendors, your top 10 suppliers, your top 10 peers, mm -hmm. your top 10 coworkers, your top 10 bosses, your top 10 subordinates, would you agree your stress level goes down? And everyone's like, yeah. Would you agree your job satisfaction goes up? For sure. So it's actually the easiest strategy. And we somehow mm -hmm. think that we shouldn't be doing it, but it's exactly to, to what you're saying. Is Now, and the other thing I really emphasize when I'm trying to um, teach this principle is top 10 does not mean good, and bottom 10 does not mean bad. Top 10 simply means you exhibit the behaviors I'm looking for, and bottom 10 means you don't. And it's not an assessment on the character of the person because 
what they're offering in a different situation can flip from top 10 to bottom 10 very quickly. Mm -hmm. And again, a very quick example of that is if you are doing a brainstorming exercise with your group and there's a devil's advocate in the group, you want to strangle them because they're shooting everything out. Well, what happens if aliens come down and abduct us? And they're like, <laughs> off to lunch. And you're like, stop, or this is not the point. But if you're now all of a sudden doing a safety exercise with the same group, that uh -huh. behavior that the devil's advocate brings becomes a top 10 asset. So mm -hmm. top 10 and bottom 10, it's not bottom 10 or bad, get rid of them. More often than not, a top 10 is a misfit. And helping them by creating an environment where they go, I, this isn't what I signed up for, to allow them to move on can be one of the most freeing things they could possibly yeah. you do for their career. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, a hundred percent. And, and just like what you were just saying there is if you focus on people's strengths. So, you know, if you're having a, if you're doing something creative and you have an operational person in there, they're going to be the person saying, if you're doing something operational and you have creative people there, they're going to be the same. So they're going to flip. So it's, it's focusing on the strengths. And I think that is the hardest thing for people to get their head around is let me focus on Sanjay's strengths and let me downplay or, or, you know, not focus on his weaknesses or perceived weaknesses. If I can offer a, a tip around that, I think more yeah. often than not, that is a result of being unclear what the desired result is. So mm, yeah. and again, I, by way of experience, I've sat around a, a C-suite table and I've said to the five or six people in the room, what is the desired result of the organization? And I'm, I'm being a little extreme when I say it, but I'll go to the first person and the first person will say, Bottom line, financial results. And I go, thank you. And the second person goes, no, it's environmental sustainability. And the third person goes, no, no, it's organizational culture. No, 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 it's corporate social responsibility. And you go around and they have five completely different views. Now, none of those are wrong. And none of them are right, as long as they're on the same page. So, you know, the problem becomes is if they just got a million dollar grant and they're trying to decide where to invest it, you're going to get people pulling and fighting. Because this guy goes, our our Top 10 is our sales guy that produced so much last year. And the other person goes, no, our top 10 is, is the front line, the lady at the front desk who makes everyone feel welcome and she makes this whole thing run. They're both mm -hmm. right, but you start pulling apart. So the more clear you can be on what the desired result is, and keep in mind that can change over time. And the desired result for a lot of people during COVID was to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. pre when it was like growing the sales, doing this. And, you know, now all of a sudden it's like, get rid of the debt because the interest rates are going through the roof. <laughs> so it's, it's totally okay that it changes, but you've got to change with it and then be able to articulate that. Because if I say the desired result is to, uh, is to run a marathon, if that's what you're trying to do, then your behaviors, what are your top 10, what are your bottom 10 behaviors flag themselves a little easier when we're clear on what the desired result is. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's an excellent point and a great clarifying point because yeah, I think not knowing what your purpose is uh, and aligning around that purpose, yeah, you're you're going to end up with silos, people on different pages, and ultimately, if you're a company, you're going to end up with customers and prospective customers getting mixed messages, getting one one message from you, one message from me, and 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 just the inconsistency is going to turn people off. Well, listen, Sanjay, this has been fantastic, and yes, um, you know, alien invasions apart, and, uh, we don't have to worry about that because we'll hit them with the second missile. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> um, but uh, this has been fantastic. And all of Sanjay's uh, information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you're doing these days. So what I've been doing is what I've been doing for the last 28 years. And, and I've mm -hmm. had the opportunity to go and, and work with groups, individuals, associations, uh, and help them to improve performance through strength-based leadership. Everything's based on the 10-80-10. And what I love to do is help people recognize that they have power, uh, and to take things to the next level. My, my goal is to rewire and inspire. Yeah, and I would encourage people, go check it out and check out the book, check out the work that Sanjay's done, 108010. It, uh, what I love about it is it, uh, it's, a, it's a simple concept. But as I always warn people, simple doesn't equate to easy. <laughs> so right. it's a simple concept, but you have to do the work to implement it. But anyway, I would I really encourage people to check it out because if there was one, if you wanted to change one thing in your business this year, it's stop focusing on trying to fix things that can't be fixed and focus on accentuating and helping things that could get better and better. So thanks again, Sanjay. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Yeah.